important there. Not exactly where Jim was this morning, but at the end of chapter number one, you can turn there and then, uh, if you would, listen to what I have to say here. Our young people are going to stay with us because I have uh, much to say this morning that relates to them, is important to them, and will be helpful to them. They're a very important part of our ministry at First Bible Baptist Church. Our, our teenagers, and of course, we have many other children in other classes this morning who will be affected by many of the things that I say here this morning. But before we uh, get started, let me say this, so I don't uh, n uh, neglect saying these in the service. First of all, I want to remind you that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We're here because of Jesus Christ. So when we're, uh, anything that we're talking about, our music, our praise, our worship, whether it be the offering, the sermon here, our response to what we hear, it's really all about Jesus. That's why First Bible Baptist Church is here. I want to be sure to be simple and straightforward, and if this is the first time that you've come to First Bible Baptist Church this morning, that I don't say some things that you don't understand. So I'm going to be very careful about my, uh, 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 my vocabulary. I'm not going to use high uh, theological terms and words that you wouldn't understand. I want anybody and everyone to be able to understand what is being said here today. That's always my intention. And I'm saying this right now more for me than I am for you. I want to make sure that what I say is understandable. Thirdly, I want you to know this, that what I have to say this morning is to unite the body of Christ. That is, the body of Christ, the big picture of the body of Christ. I'm not here to condemn somebody else's church or the way somebody else does things. That's, that it is other churches' business, the way they conduct their worship services, uh, the various things that they focus in on. I'm here today to bring unity to First Bible Baptist Church. We are a team, so what I have to say here this morning really isn't to disparage somebody else. Uh-oh, big word. That's not a theological word, though. I'm not here to criticize somebody else. I'm here this morning to uh, bring our church together, so I want you to know that I'm here always to unite. Then the last thing, if this is the first time and the only time that you'll ever hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want you to understand this that everybody, all of us are sinners, everyone. You may never come back to a service like this ever again. You may never hear the message that I'm going to give you in the next minute ever again, but I want you to know that we're all sinners, and because of that, we are separated from God. There's a separation. There's a penalty, and there's judgment for sin. The Bible tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved Saved from what? Eternal damnation. Jesus said in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. There are consequences for not accepting Christ as Savior. So we're here this morning to preach the gospel of Christ. We're all sinners and there's judgment due our sin. But Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again according to the Scriptures. And the Bible says that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, repent of your sin, call upon the name of the Lord, believing that Christ is who the Bible says He is and who He claimed to be, you ask Him to forgive you and save you and give you the gift of eternal life he will do exactly that. And it has nothing to do with what church you belong to, what church you attend. It has everything to do with you having a personal relationship with God. So please, I don't want you to be con confused by anything that I say this morning, that what I'm saying is you've got to be like me, or you've got to be one of the people in our church, or you've got to believe exactly everything that I believe. Now, there are some things that are very cut, very clear, the simple gospel of Christ. That's how a person is saved. But no church, no denomination, no group of people has a monopoly on the truth of God's word. Jesus said, speaking of himself, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The title of my message this morning is the longest title that I've ever given a sermon. 
The title is this, you'll never get where you are going if you forget how you got where you are. Okay, let's all repeat that together. No, no, I won't put that on you, but I will say it again for you. You'll never get where you are going if you forget how you got where you are. Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning and ask your blessings on God's people today. We thank you for your love, for your wonderful grace, for your wonderful salvation. We thank you for those who may be guests with us. They're special people today, for sure. They're gifts to our congregation, and in every way, we want to treat them in a very good and positive and hospitable way. We're here this morning primarily, though, to lift the name of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And everything that I'll have to say here today in these next few moments has to do with glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. Let there be no mistake in anyone's mind about that today. We pray all of this, and we do thank you, the, uh, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your love extended towards us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you, I already did, to open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter number 1. Now, I didn't do that, so bear, bear with me. I told you to do it and didn't do it myself. Nehemiah chapter number 1. I just want to pick up, it's been some time ago since we read this, but you'll remember that Nehemiah found himself in a very disturbing set of circumstances. He was 800, almost 800 miles away from Jerusalem, and he was a prisoner, he was a slave, he was a captive in a foreign king's court. Well, he realized after a brief conversation that the city of Jerusalem laid waste. Now, it wasn't like he didn't suspect that or didn't know that to some degree, but once again, it is confirmed to uh, Nehemiah that that's the state of Jerusalem. If you read chapter number one, you'll find out that he was brokenhearted. It, it got to him. Maybe for the first time, he realized that he hadn't prayed for the peace of Jerusalem. He hadn't done anything about the restoration of Jerusalem. He knew from the Old Testament that the way things were isn't the way they were supposed to be. And he had done very little about it. Well, God burdened him at this time to pray about Jerusalem. And what he did was this. Although he had nothing, he had no resources, he didn't even have his own freedom, what he did was he said, Lord, I just want to make myself available. I'm praying for Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. I realize that the people who are living there are afflicted. I realize also that the gates are burned with fire, and, uh, but I'm a, I'm a captive, I'm a servant, I'm a, I'm a cupbearer in a king's court. I really can't do anything about it, but Lord... If you, if you would show me favor, I want you to know that I want to be a part of the solution to the problem. That was his prayer. Now, that's quite a prayer. Uh, maybe, maybe you think that that's, well, you know, so what, what? But that's something when any individual comes to the place and says, you know, I want to become part of the solution. When it, we're talking about the kingdom of God, that's exactly what God wants each and every one of us to be. He wants you and he wants me, he wants our church as a body and individually to be part of the solution to the problem of the sins of men. We are the, re, we are the uh, recipients. We're responsible for the distribution, for the preaching, for the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we pick up in verse uh, 1 of chapter 2, it says, It came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, this is four months later. After four months, Nehemiah has prayed, made himself available, and nothing happens for four months. Well, I shouldn't say nothing happens, because certainly he's thinking, he's planning, he's preparing, he's praying, Lord, if you give me an opportunity to be a solution to the problem, I know exactly what I would do. Based on the resources I have, I know where I would start. So the time is not wasted. Even though four months goes by and his prayer is not answered immediately, the time is not wasted. 
Well, anyway, verse 2, wherefore it says, well, excuse me, let me go back to the end of verse 1. The king looks at Nehemiah, and he realizes that his countenance, his facial expression, he looks depressed. He says, man, you look sad. There's something wrong with you. And, of course, Nehemiah had never been that way before in his presence. Wherefore, verse 2 says, the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. He shouldn't have, uh, he shouldn't have looked depressed in the king's court, so to speak. I mean, he should have been in there happy and, you know, uh, making pretend that everything was all right, even though it wasn't. He said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres or graves, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? So he's kind of bold. He says, king, you know, I am depressed, and my countenance is fallen because things are not good back home, and I can't get over it. It's burdening my heart. The king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. The king says, Well, what can I do to help you? What do you want? What are you looking for? How can I bring some relief? And it says that Nehemiah prayed. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. That was a pretty bold request. Now, you and I are kind of used to reading the book of, of, of Nehemiah. We're used to reading, reading the Bible. And oftentimes, we take the miracles that we re read about, we kind of take them for granted like, yeah, well, big deal. This was a big deal. This is a big deal for a slave to look at the king and say, listen, you really mean business? You really want to help me? Then let me tell you what's wrong, and I'm asking you, will you help me resolve this problem? Now, he didn't know what was going to come out of that, but this is one thing he did know. That four months before, he had said to the Lord, he said, Lord, I make myself available he, play, he prayed, planned uh, through these four months, and then one day the king said, something's wrong, isn't it? Can I help you? And Nehemiah knew instinctively that this was the answer to his prayer. He waited four months, and now the answer to prayer. He sensed that God was going to work for him. So, boldly he said to the king, he said, well, I'll tell you what, the people are in affliction, the gates are burned with fire, will you help me do something about it? And the king said, why, of course I will. Sure, I'll help you. That was an incredible answer to prayer. A man who was a prisoner, a man who had no financial or material resources, he didn't even have his own freedom. He said, I make myself available to be the solution to the problem, but Lord, I've got constraints, and you're going to have to help me with them. And he did exactly that. What a lesson that is for so many sets of circumstances in our lives. Asking God to help you with something for his honor and for his glory, being willing to wait on it, to pray on it, to plan and prepare during that time. And then one day, that day comes when God says, through a human individual, he says, okay, it's time to go to work. Now that's the story of Nehemiah, at least up to this point. Now what I would like to do is I would like to tell you that 1039 North Greece Road is sold. It's sold. It's over. <laughs> yes, it's over. It's over. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'll tell you the people that care the most, they're the people that gave the most. The people that care the most are the people that gave the most. I know that. It's always true, isn't it? Who do you think 
got relief when the walls of the city of Jerusalem were built 52 days after Nehemiah walked into town. I guarantee you when Nehemiah stood back and what had not happened in 135 years happened in 52 days because he got involved himself. There wasn't anybody that was any, any happier than Nehemiah when he saw God go to work. Sold. Well, let me just tell you a little bit of the story. Here we are in the lawyer's office on, Friday, on Thursday afternoon. Uh, the, there's a bunch of people there. Uh, on the right is Wally, Mark Maynard, Carl Catrone, and Jim Stupp is sitting down. Those are, Wally is our business manager, and those three men are trustees of our church. Then seated is the lawyer for East Henrietta and their business manager on the left. Of course, you can see where I am. And then the lady there is the lady that had all the money. I don't even know what her name was, but you'll notice I have my arm around her. You see that? The reason why I had my arm around her is because I didn't want her to get away. Because she has all the cash. She's the one that had all the checks to distribute to everyone. But this happened, I would say, about 4.30 on Thursday afternoon. Finally, with some blips and some bumps and some, and I won't go into that, uh, we finally came to the closing of 1039 North Greece Road. Five years, two months, and about 10 days since we moved into this building somewhere around there, give or take five or 10 days, a week or so, we have been praying for this. I remember someone asking me at a business meeting when we were planning to build this, someone said, and I don't remember who it was, but the person asked me this question. They said, Pastor, what if we don't sell 1039? Now, I answered it intelligently. I said to the person and to the rest of the people who were at that meeting, I said, I don't even want to think about that right now. That was my response. I understood generally at that time the consequences of not selling that building within about 12 months of us moving into this building. Well, we went more than four years past that 12 months to where we are now. There are a lot of people to thank. And as I said, the people who will rejoice the most are the people who have invested the most. There's no question in my mind. First of all, I want to thank the people of First Bible Baptist Church, the whole church. Some of you have continued to give to the building project for the last five years, beyond when we moved into, in, in here. And that would be less than 10% of the people, I would guess, something like that. But 10% uh, of you, or maybe 8% of you, continued to give to this building knowing that we were enduring uh, financial constraints, owning two uh, churches, the two largest churches in the town of Greece. I would always humorously tell people, well, I'm the pastor of the two largest churches in the town of Greece. And they'd look at me like, well, one is unoccupied, but uh, the other one we use. Well, the, I would have to do that because oftentimes it wasn't very humorous, as you can imagine. I want to thank also my, my prayer group, probably 20 people that I met with for the last three years and eight months, every Thursday morning with very, very few exceptions during that time. And our primary goal every time we got together was to pray for the sale of that building. For three years and eight months, we prayed for something and didn't get an answer to prayer. You ever prayed for something for three years and eight months and never got an answer to prayer? I'm not sure that I have ever done that, uh, except on maybe a couple other occasions when I was praying for a relative or some situation that was almost seemingly impossible in the first place. But I want to thank those people, and I don't need to name them, but I'm going to have them all over to my house, and we're going to have a party at my house. And I appreciate all of you. I mentioned the givers that continued. I want to mention right now, I want to thank the staff and many people on the staff who have sacrificed during that period of time. I don't need to go into details. Some of you know the details, and no one's asking for a pat on the back or credit, but I want you to know there are a lot of people that sacrificed during that period of time and didn't whine, complain, and moan about it. I don't think. They didn't to me anyway, I assume. 
I want to thank Mike Palumbo. Mike Palumbo is a church member. He's not employed by First Bible Baptist Church, but he is the glue that made this happen. Humanly speaking, he is the glue that made this happen. And you have no idea. I, I have a real good idea, but Wally Malcolm and Carl Catrone and others have a very good idea of the work that it took Mike Palumbo. Mike isn't here today. Mike is on his way on vacation, recovering from trying to sell 1039 <laughs> for the last five years with his family, and rightly so. That was planned, by the way. His vacation was planned this weekend. We closed on 30, Thursday. The sermon that I'm preaching to you today was planned back in July. I didn't know if we'd ever close on 1039. I'm not done, but I want you to know what I'm going to tell you today was planned four and a half months ago. And you'll see the coincidence of selling it on Thursday and what I'm going to say today, all right? I want to thank um, Carl Catrone also. Carl, one of our trustees, put a lot of his own elbow grease into it. Again, a volunteer, not an employee of First Bible Baptist Church. I couldn't afford to pay Mike. I couldn't afford to pay Carl for all the services. Let me tell you just about Mike, though, and I need to say this. Mike was our real estate agent to sell the building. Conservatively, his commission should be, conservatively, $45,000 for doing this. He threw that all in the pot. We have benefited as a church $45,000 didn't go out at the closing because Mike Palumbo donated his commission to First Bible Baptist Church. $45,000. I want you to know that. I want to thank specific members on our staff that this put undue uh, 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 responsibilities on them. And that would be the maintenance staff of First Bible Baptist Church and then I would extend that to the people who for the last five years have plowed the parking lot and cut the grass at 1039. We've been doing that for five years. Some, many of the people that have done that are volunteers. I want to thank the Lord for God's timing. Now I mention him last because he is the most important. I want to thank God for God's timing. This is when God wanted us to sell the building. I am convinced. Did I enjoy this? No. A lot of people do not enjoy the difficulties and challenges of the Christian life, but they know that God has called us to suffering. I imagine Paul the Apostle, oftentimes, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, was wondering where God was in some of the things that he went through. But in the end, he was able to say, I fought a good fight. I could be very honest with you. There were times when I really did want to give up and quit. I really did. I felt that way. I haven't done that very much in my life, uh, given up and quit. I've been married to my wife for 44 years. She's the one that hasn't quit, really, though. She's the one that should have. But I've been here for 40 years in one job. I have had a job every day of my life since I was 12 years old. I don't give up and quit easily. But I was on the edge of doing that here, and uh, no one here but the Lord really understands that, some of the things. And I'm not asking for your pity because I'm thanking God for God's timing. What is gone is our mortgage. What is gone is the utility bill. What is gone is the insurance, the maintenance, and repair. Last year, we put $35,000 on the roof at 1039 North Greece Road because we still owned it. We had to fix it. Taxes, yes, churches pay taxes. Miscellaneous, for example, we had to maintain the fire alarm system, an elevator telephone system in there. These are things you never think of. And what is gone, maybe the greatest thing, is the dark cloud that I feel that hung over our church, knowing that we were under the financial pressure of owning 1039 North Greece Road. So now, I can truly look back at 1039 North Greece Road with nostalgia, and I can say, boy, do I remember the good times. And we'll forget about the bad five years that followed that. That's gone. 
But I can look at back. I can remember the first time that I walked into the chapel of Building One, my wife and I, in, and I think it was September the 2nd, 1972, we walked in there. I had got uh, trusted Christ on Tuesday, Sunday we went to church. I can think of all of the great and wonderful things that happened at 1039 North Greece Road. I want you to know that that was tainted all these years. There were times when I didn't even want to drive by that building. I couldn't even drive down North Greece Road. I couldn't drive down it because of what it represented to me. I'd go around it like Jesus avoiding, he went through Samaria, I wouldn't. I didn't want to go through it. I didn't want to be reminded. Anyway, I don't want you to feel sorry for me or for myself because it's over. It's sold and it's over. It's gone. I don't have to worry about the dark cloud. I can look at 1039 and remember the many, many good times, hundreds, thousands of good days at 1039 North Greece Road. The people that are moving in there, right from the beginning, I know that there were people saying, boy, I hope this becomes a church and not a Muslim temple. I hope this becomes a church and not a gambling hall or a dance hall or whatever, a real estate uh, you know, office or whatever. And there is a church moving in there, and the people that I have met from that church are wonderful, wonderful Christian people. And glory to God for that. I feel so much better about that. We have a fresh, and we have a new start. We have a new vision for our church. And we, just, we unrolled this September 16th. What's today, November 18th? Two months ago, we unrolled this. Why? Because we decided we have to go forward regardless of 1039. If we never sell it, we can't just circle the wagons and wait for Jesus to take us out of here. We must go forward. So two months ago, we launched this generation now, and I'm going to talk much more about that. We have a fresh start and a new start. So I'm giving you a little bit of, of, uh, of, uh, of our history at 1039. Let me give you a little bit of history of being right here. I wonder how many of you, how many of you, if you would stand, were here when we began to plan this building. Now, if you don't know when that was, that was the year 2003. If you've come after 2003, you weren't here when we started planning this. But you would have to be here from 2003 and before. Would you stand? You've been part of this from the very beginning. I want you to look around at all of these people. They have stuck by the stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And those of us that are new in here, we ought to give these people a round of applause for sticking it out. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you for sticking it out. You may not know this or you've forgotten it. When we, start, when we thought about building this, we first went to the sports park. We had purchased that land at the end of the last century, if you'll recall, and we were developing a sports park. Well, there's a lot of property over there, and we considered maybe putting the church on that property. Long story short, we determined not to do that. We looked for another piece of property. This piece of property we bought and I think we closed on it somewhere in, in 2004, I think, that was the date that we did that, give or take a few uh, months in that year. I think towards the end of 2004 is when we uh, purchased the land, and then we had a groundbreaking sometime later on. We purchased this piece of property here for $580,000, and when we went to the closing, uh, we paid cash for this piece of property, if you recall. You people gave us $580,000 to buy this property. The people that you just saw stand. And some other people did too. But some of those people have passed on. 
We've had a lot of good church members from First Bible Baptist Church that have gone home to be with the Lord in the last five years. I think most recently, I think of Landis Lundberg. Landis has been one of the, just one of the cheerleaders for First Bible Baptist Church in every way. He just passed this year at 81 years of age. He was a trustee, he was a deacon, he was one of the financial brains in this church going almost all, all the way back to the beginning of First Bible Baptist Church. But I only use his name as a representative of many other people like him that, that went on to, uh, to be with the Lord. And those people were solid people and people that helped us get where we are. You'll never get where you're going if you forget how you got where you are. You understand that? It's so important before we go forward to make sure we understand how we got where we are. When we moved into this building, ultimately, we were, and maybe you forgot this, we were unable to finish the building. We ran out of money, so we chopped off this wing over here, the education, the youth wing, we chopped that off, we stopped, we rearranged things so we could fit in here and we could do church and we were able to do that. And of course, since we've been in here, we still made, based on our needs, we've made some other uh, changes and whatnot. Although, largely, the building is the way we built it. We have very few regrets. We spent three years planning this building before we ever put the shovel in the ground, and then we spent about 18 months actually building it. We went over the plans and over the plans and over and over and over and tweaked this and tweaked that till we got what we have here today, and I think that most of us, if not all of us, are very pleased with what ultimately came out at 990 Manitou Road. In our business plan, we did fundraising, we did bridge loans, we took the equity out of 1039, we took the equity out that we had out of our school, and we put it in this building, and we took loans on that so that when we would sell 1039, we would pay them off, and we didn't. That's what the big problem has been, among others, owning it. We took another loan beyond our mortgage, so we continued to pay the bridge loan and the mortgage at 990. That's what, part of what we have been relieved of. We also were given some interest-free loans by people at First Bible Baptist Church. They've never asked for any recognition, and maybe they'll be mad at me when I mention their names right now, but I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, I think of Jane Pesky. Jane Pesky helped us and gave us an interest-free loan uh, the, um, the Peskys family, uh, Dick and Lee Pesky, also gave us an interest-free loan. And then Hank and Sheila McLeod gave us an interest-free loan to help us through some of the difficult times in building this. They've never moaned, they've never griped, they've never complained. They were people who believed in what we were doing, and I appreciate them. I want you to know that. But all of these things, mortgages and these loans and bridge loans and people gave cash. We raised almost $6 million to build this building uh, over a period of four years from the people. All of that came together for 990 Manitou Road. All of this, all of this, let me be, help me now and pay close attention. All of this is going to be eliminated by rolling one bridge loan into our mortgage payment and refinancing our mortgage on this property. And that should effectively, uh, and will effectively, lower our payment significantly, thousands of dollars a month. Now, let me tell you why we haven't been able to do that. Because we own 1039 North Greece Road. And to have those bridge loans... Those of you that work in real estate, you'll understand what I'm going to say. We had to cross-collateralize all our properties. In other words, everything that we own is tied together legally. So if a creditor, if we didn't pay on 1039, they could come after the sports park. You understand? They could come after the school. They could come after and try to take, force us to sell one of them. And we would be legally bound to do that. That's what cross-collateralization does. We agreed to that 
to keep us going forward until we sold the building. We sold the building, and now we can refinance. I know that we can drop our interest rate probably 1.5%. You say, that ain't much. 1.5% of millions of dollars over 20 years is a lot of money. It's thousands of dollars a month in interest payments. We already have the ball rolling. I've already talked to the man who's done it for us before, and he's already contacted banks and working on it right now. So my point is this. All of the things that we owed are going to be rolled into one debt. Let me tell you, when you're looking at this, owing this person and that person and this group and that group and this building and all that, it's like, oh, Lord, help me. And it's all going to be rolled into one manageable debt that is less than what we planned on being able to handle when we built the building. Significantly less. $10,000 a month or more less than we figured what we could handle. Now, I don't, I don't mind telling you that the last four years hasn't been good economically for our country. This hasn't been a good time for the country either. We've got people in here that lost jobs or are downscaled or whatever it is. Or many of you have gone through your own financial problems during this time. And at the same time, God has sustained us to be here today to celebrate the sale of 1039 North Greece Road. Now, let's go back to the vision. Remember, I was going to preach what I'm preaching now regardless of what happened. God enabled us to sell the building three days before this sermon was being preached. It makes it a whole lot more important. I would have preached what I'm going to preach to you now. I would have brought it to you anyway because it's the vision of First Bible Baptist Church. But right now, I don't have an 800-pound gorilla on my back, and neither do you. <laughs> I can't tell you what a difference it makes for our church. We entered into this vision process back in April. I won't rehearse it all. We went through a SWAT process. We stopped and looked at everything we are doing, and we had what, what uh, one of our men, uh, Randy Weaver, calls disturbing conversations. I said, you can say anything you want as long as you say it to me respectfully. Well, that was a difficult time because not everybody agrees with everything that we're doing or the way we're doing it around here. And being the leader, I, that eventually comes back to me and I have to bear the consequence or, of that. We went through our Back to Church series during the summer and established the pillars of ministry, connect, grow, serve, go. And we're asking our people, that's you in case you're wondering who you're talking to, we're asking our people to do three things at First Bible Baptist Church. Come on Sunday morning and worship God. Now we were already here, so let's make sure we worship God while we're here. We're not asking you to do, we're, we're asking you to do two things. Come, show up, and worship. Just don't show up. Just don't come to church. Come to church and worship God. And what we're doing is we're eliminating any competition or distraction. We're not going to have Bible Institute. We're not going to have big picture Bible studies. We're not going to have Link. We're not going to have any of these breakout things on Sunday morning. We're going to come together as a church and worship God with none of those things keeping us out of the auditorium. Okay? This isn't just my decision, by the way. This is a result of lots of people sitting down and talking. Remember I talked about the SWAT process? This is what we, as a, as a leadership group of First Bible Baptist Church, determined to do. So we're asking everybody to do three things. Number one, come to church and be worship God on Sunday morning. Number two, if you were here last week, you heard Pastor Bredo talk about life groups. We're asking everybody to get involved in a life group. That's where we're going to have fellowship. That's where we're going to grow. That's where we will have Christian accountability as God's people. 
everybody, by the beginning of next year, our goal is to have 40 life groups, a minimum of about 600 people involved in them. That means we're going to have to about double what we're doing right now. But I'm asking everybody, consider being in a life group, a small group setting where you are accountable to other Christians. And if you don't like one leader or group, you're going to be free to move where you feel comfortable. There's a lot of people in here that don't want to be where I am or I don't want to be where you are. I still love you in Jesus. I want you to know that. And I know you love me. But we're, we're going to have lots of choices for people to find a small group, a life group, where they can be involved. And then the third thing is this. third thing we're asking you is to get involved and serve someplace. Be an Awana worker, a Sunday school teacher, be, work in our athletic ministry. Be part of the worship team. Do something for God. Get involved. That's all we're asking you to do. Don't you think Christians ought to worship God? Get involved in koinonia, Christian fellowship and Bible study, and then Christians ought to do something for God. I don't think we're asking people to do anything that's unreasonable or unbiblical, but let me just say this. You'd be surprised how many Christians don't do any of those three things and still call themselves Christians. You know what I call that? I call that McChurch. It's McChurch. It's McDonald Christianity. It's cheap. It's junk. It's grease and it's garbage. And I don't want a pastor and you don't want to be in a church that's a McChurch. You don't want to be there. You want to be in a church that worships God, that's growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and the people are willing to go to work for the kingdom of God and do something, one thing for God. I'm not asking you to give your, your life in the sense that you have to quit your job and, and go to work for First Bible Baptist Church for free. I'm not asking that. Find a place of service in your church. How am I doing so far? September, September 16th. We head back to church Sunday. I want you to know this. You'll never get where you're going if you forget how you got where you are. Now, let me go back. It's all about Jesus. I'm trying to use words that are not confusing to you. Everything I'm saying is to unite the body of Christ. And I want you to know it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that's important. That's what we are called to do, to preach the gospel. In Nehemiah chapter 1, we read, and I rehearsed this with you, we re read of the frustrating dilemma in which Nehemiah found himself. Convinced of his own lack of concern, he repented to God, he uh, admitted his own sin, and he said, God, I want to go to work. But I'm limited. I don't have anything except desire. All I have is availability. And those are two very, very important things. He had desire and availability. What happens in chapter 1 is that Nehemiah, listen, Nehemiah goes vertical. It's all about his relationship with God. Everything that follows in the book is because he has a relationship with God vertically. That's what worship is all about. That's why the great emphasis on coming and worshiping God together. It all starts there. Read Nehemiah chapter 1. Most of the chapter is a prayer. By the way, we have a church prayer meeting every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock right in this room. You're all invited. First Bible Baptist Church has a prayer meeting for the, ch for the congregation at 8 o'clock every Wednesday night right here in the auditorium, and everybody is invited to come to that. But Nehemiah goes vertical. He then plans, uh, plans and prays, and he waits for God to answer. And then God responds in such a way that can only be God. In time, what happens is the obstacle to him getting involved becomes the door of opportunity. The king was the obstacle, and the obstacle becomes the door to opportunity. At First Bible Baptist Church, we've had a big obstacle for the last five years, and now that's been removed, and it's become the door of opportunity for First Bible Baptist Church to realize this 
generation now, now. You'll never get where you're going if you forget how you got where you are. With little, with only desire, availability, and now the favor of the king, and we have favor of a king ourselves, as a matter of fact, Nehemiah proceeds and opens the door for God to intercede. He headed to Jerusalem, and he had the king's favor and promise, and he went to Jerusalem. All he had was desire and availability. And 52 days later, the wall was built. How did he do that? Because he had desire. He made himself available. That's what God wants from each and every one of us. God wants us to, God wants us to, to make ourselves available to him, to become part of the solution to the problem. Nehemiah had a dilemma. He didn't have anything except desire, and he made himself available but he was a prisoner. He didn't have any money. He didn't have a job, per se, that paid him any money. He didn't have anything going for him. He was a captive. He was a slave. He was a cupbearer. The king could have extinguished his life in a thought if he wanted to. But he said, Lord, I'm available. I'm available, and I have the desire to become part of the solution to the problem. That's what every Christian ought to have availability and a desire to be part of the solution to the problem that this world finds itself in. It's lost. It's going to hell. The world needs to hear about Christ. You and I have the solution to their biggest problem. Are you available? Do you have a desire? Hey, you ought to be sitting there going, yeah! And you're sitting there looking at me, asking yourself, do I? Am I available? Do I have a desire? That's Nehemiah's dilemma. Are you available? I can't answer that for you. I'm available. I have a desire to do something. Well, I don't have anything. You don't have to have anything. Nehemiah was a prisoner. He was 700 miles away from the problem. He didn't have any money. He didn't have anything except two things, desire, and he made himself available. That's all God wants from you. He'll provide the resources to resolve the problem. Will you make yourself available, and do you have a desire. That's your dilemma. It's the Nehemiah dilemma. What are you going to do about the big problem? Will you make yourself available? Do you have a desire to do this? Do you have a desire to do this? That's the question. This generation now, here's a vision statement. People ask, well, pastor, what is this generation now? Listen carefully. This generation now is a strategy to engage people of all ages with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what churches are supposed to do. Understanding the vulnerability of youth the strategy purposes to passionately develop and model genuine Christian worship, number one. Number two, growth, life groups. Number three, service in order to positively impact their church and community to reach out. This vertical realignment of the church's focus will authenticate the presence of God to everyone, and with urgency, we need to do this now. Now, we said back in September 16th, we said that 80% of our Christian young people, when they graduate from high school, they're walking away from Christianity, and I'm going to tell you why, and this is proven to be true, because kids don't see genuine Christianity in their adults, in their parents. They don't see it in their church. There's no compulsion to live a Christian life. They walk out the door. They're not against Christianity. They're just not for it. They've been neutered to the gospel. 
It's not that important. You know why I know? I watched my parents, how they live their lives. I watched the other Christians at church, what they do. I know how they live their lives. I hear what the pastor says. I've read the Bible. I know how serious this is supposed to be, but they don't take it seriously. So why should I? I'm all for mom and dad. I hope you have a good time in your church, mom and dad. It's a nice place, but I'm moving on. I'm going someplace else. I'm going to make a name for myself, my own life. Yours is pretty dull and boring. What they need to see is God working in our lives. That's what our kids need to see. They need to experience the manifest presence of God in their lives and in their church. And they'll never go back. They'll never go anywhere else. But when they see McChurch, week in and week out, McChristianity, churchianity, Week in, week out, and in their home, it's easy to walk away from that boring lifestyle. Read my Bible. My parents don't read their Bible. Pray. They don't pray. They skip church whenever some, they want to go on a picnic, they want to go to the football game. Not, when anything else comes up, they don't go to church. They're not in a Bible study. They don't serve God. They don't do the things I hear or read in the Bible. Why should I? Now you say, well, kids ought to figure it out. And they're responsible for themselves. They sure are. But we're responsible to give them a wonderful and a good example. That's what this generation now is all about. So I'm glad that you asked the, the question. What is this generation all about? This generation is about personal, spiritual, ministry growth. That's what it's all about. It's all about, it's all about uh, secondly, it's about uh, the completion of this facility. We started nine years ago, almost 10 years ago to build this building. I'm not quitting. Now, God may kill me, and that's okay. And that sounds pretty good right now. But it's our responsibility to finish what we started here. We got a monkey off our back. We never finished that wing over there, people. You know what this generation now is? It's coming back and finishing what we started. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm never going to borrow another dollar the rest of my life for this church. Never going to borrow another dollar. I borrowed enough. You know what I'm doing? I'm paying things back right now, and I'm enjoying it. I'm going to get rid of four major debts probably in the next two months. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Here's your money. Get out of here. Get out of my life. And the only thing we're going to have is First Bible Baptist Church right here, just this building right here. And we're going to be paying a lot less for it than we figured we could plan for, more than $10,000 less than when we built the building. We're going to be rolling forward. It's time to go forward. We can't circle the wagons and wait for Jesus to come and bail us out. Well, don't you know what's going on? You, did you see the election? You see what's going on in Israel? You see all this stuff? Why don't we just wait for Jesus to come? Where do you find that in the Bible? Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. You keep on working until the night comes and one of these days, Jesus is going to take, we're going to keep working and do what God called us to do. What is this generation now all about? This generation now is the completion of our facility here. And it has to do with effective outreach at every level of the church body. Sunday school, summit, merge, missions, adults. People say, well, what do I get out of it? I've heard adults say, what do I get out of it? Hold it, just a second, just a second. You sound, like, you sound like a lot of people in America right now. What do I get out of it? What do you get out of it? What do you put into it? What do we put into it? I didn't come to First Bible Baptist Church 40 years ago when I walked away from Kodak. I didn't come out here and say, Pastor Mullen, what do I get out of it? I never even, that even crossed my mind. What's wrong with you? That's not what Christianity is. What am I going to get out of it? You'll get something out of it. 
But that's not why you get involved in anything. By the way, you will get something out of it. You know what you'll do? You'll worship God, and you'll see the benefits of worshiping God and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're going to get involved in the joy of Christian service and ministering to other people and taking the word of God to the world. That's what you're going to get out of it. Is that all? That's all. That's all. That's all you're going to get out of it. And if that doesn't thrill your soul, you are in the wrong building this morning. Or you need to get your heart right. God has called us to go to work for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the most important work going on in the face of this earth. Kingdoms, countries, fads and fashions will come and they will go but Jesus is king and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the ultimate solution to the ultimate problem of man don't you get that this isn't Mick religion this isn't Mick church this isn't Mick Christianity this is the kingdom of God this is the gospel of Christ this is what your creator set up some time ago to rescue man from the penalty of his stupidity his rebellion and his foolishness against him and we get involved we get we're part of it well what is what do I get out of it this is what you get out of it. Personal spiritual ministry growth, the completion of our facility, effective outreach at every level of our church. In other words, what we're going to get out of this is we're going to do what God has called us to do. That's what we're going to get out of it. We're going to do what God has called us to do as a church. Now we're going to start a capital fundraising project. I've announced that all the way back in July. I had a Sunday night. I invited everybody in when we hadn't sold the building. And I said, this is where we are financially. I want you to understand where we are. And I want you to understand that we need to go to work to resolve these problems. And you will hear more. That was July. It's now November. I didn't forget. I didn't wake up last night and go, gee, I remember saying something about that. We've been planning. We've been preparing. We have been developing this generation now, and this is what we need to do. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I've put a list of things. We're going to finish this wing over here, a family life and youth center. We're going to finish that. We're not going to borrow one penny to do it. If it takes 55 years to build it cash, that's what we will do, okay? We need to do some things in the auditorium. Turn the, so turn the sound system down. Would you do that, Jason, for me right now? Turn it down. It isn't going to be long, and this is what it's going to sound like in here on Sunday. We brought our old soundboard in here into a $4 million room. Go ahead, turn it up now. They get the picture. That's what it sounds like in here without a sound system. Our, our soundboard came from 1039 North Greece Road. It is an old-fashioned soundboard. We have professional people that work in the industry, and they said, Pastor, it is failing. One channel at a time. We just shut down channel 18. We shut down channel 9. We shut. It's burning itself out to the point where we're not going to be able to use it at some point. We are today. It sounds great. What do we need that for? It sounds great. <laughs> it's going to get worse. I promise you that. We need to replace that. We wanted to put a new one in when we built the building. But that was one of the things that we couldn't do. We didn't have the money to do it. So when we talk about things like that, children's rec facilities, we want to put a, we want to put some, like a jungle gym, we want to put some, a, uh, what do you call it? A playground. We want to put a playground in on our property here. Our kids go outside all the, t all the time. And they go out and they sit in the grass and eat grass and all that stuff. But the, we, don't, we don't have a playground here. We've got hundreds of kids here all the time. We don't even have a playground. Now, let me tell you, we don't have a playground over at the sports park, although the whole, the whole park is a playground if you want to look at it that way. Two days ago, one of our men, he's sitting here right now. If you want me to prove it, uh, we'll have a conversation with him. He called me over to the sports park. He said, Pastor, we need to have a playground over here. And I know that we can raise the money. It's not going to cost the church a penny. 
I am committing myself to raise the money to do this. This was on Friday afternoon. He didn't know I was going to preach this message this morning. God's already working in people's hearts to do the things that we need to do. Things like that are God things to me. They show me that God is at work, and it's really not ultimately up to me, just like it wasn't ultimately up to Nehemiah to successfully complete everything. Well, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. These are the things, some of the things that we're going, going to have to do. I don't have the time to go into the specifics. What we are going to do on Christmas Day, we're going to start our fundraising with a Christmas giving offering for Christmas Day. On December 30th, we will have the last Sunday of the year, we will have a commitment Sunday. We will ask people to make a commitment to what we are going to do. And between now and then, you'll have many more specifics so you'll understand exactly what we are going to do. I could enumerate or I could be much uh, more specific on the list that I put up there, but that is a list that has been accumulated by the leadership of this church. These are the things that we need to do to go forward as a church. None of them are payroll, none of them are health care benefits, none of them are vacations, none of them are new cars for the pastors, none of them are anything for any of the people that work here. All of those things are for reaching this generation now. Every penny of all of those expenditures, none of them are for salaries or the soft costs of running an organization. If you have that question, I want you to understand that right now. Begin planning, praying, preparing. You have a Nehemiah moment. You may be sitting there, and this is a rough economy. I know it's a rough economy. It, it's not as rough as it was Wednesday for me, I can tell you that. But it is a rough economy. And I don't know what's going to happen the next year or so. Right now, I'm not looking at it like, you know, it's going to be a boom town, Rochester, New York. I don't see any big businesses moving in and everybody's salaries being doubled in the next year. I don't see that happening. But I don't think that needs to happen, although it would be nice. But then we would be relying upon ourselves, wouldn't we? Nehemiah had a desire and he made himself available. That's it. Do you have a desire to be part of what God is doing and are you available? I didn't say, how much are you going to give? I didn't say that. I'm not saying that. That's not my goal. I'll tell you what my goal is. I made up this envelope. I'm an artist. I made up this envelope, all right? This envelope says, this generation now. You're going to see these everywhere. And this is what I want to challenge our people to do beginning next year. You pr plan, pray. I want everybody to put at least a dollar in this. Every week. A dollar. Or whatever you want, feel free. My goal isn't the numerical amount of money. Ultimately, that counts. We know that. My goal is this, is to get you involved. One dollar. One dollar. Uh, your kids, teenagers, one dollar. Put a dollar in there and put it in the offering plate. At the end of our offering that week, we'll count the envelopes. If we had 1,426 people in church, we had, you know, I don't know, 100 babies or whatnot, take them out. The babies probably won't be putting much in the offering. <laughs> take the babies out. We had 126 babies, so we're down to 1,300 people came to church, and we got 786 envelopes. I want to get the rest of you involved in this generation now. The goal is to get everybody involved. The goal isn't a monetary goal initially. When everybody gets a heart to do the right thing, ultimately the goal will be reached. When we built this building, listen to me, this is a guess on my part. It's an educated guess. But about 85% of the people at this church got involved in this building project. You never get 100%. You can fancy yourself to be one of the 15%. I heard what the pastor said, and I ain't getting involved. I don't do that. Why don't we all put a dollar, put a dollar in the envelope?
By the way, if you want to start giving now, you can do that. You can help yourself and just put now on your envelope or vision or something like that. But I'll have a gazillion of these envelopes every week so everybody can have an envelope and put a dollar or two dollars or whatever you want to put in here to reach the ultimate goal for this generation now. Standing taller today. <laughs> my shoulders are coming up. I don't have an 800 pound gorilla on my bag anymore. It's time for our church to go forward now. It's not time to circle the wagons and wait for, see if Jesus is going to come. Uh, you know, it's tough economy. You know, it, 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 uh, we better just circle the wagons and occupy till I come. That's what Jesus said. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for bringing us here. Lord, there's been lots of questions, and I don't understand it all. I just submit myself to your sovereign leadership your omnipotence, your omniscience, and your timing, Lord, I believe is always right. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I've gone way over today, Brother Jim. You come on out here. That's okay. It's a day for celebration. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I want everybody to go to the cafe, and it's free on me today, all right? Free on me. Well, listen, I got, I got a couple quick announcements, but this one's an important one. I hold in my hand. you know what this is? you know what these are? They're leaving all Look at them running out the door. I know, right? They're all like diving for their donuts. It's crazy. <laughs> Carol, can I give you one of these? Would you like one? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Please. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, one for you? A little cookie? You sure? They're good. No calories at all? You sure? There you go. That's right. Listen, here's the thing. As you know, it's, uh, we got a little thing we call the, uh, the Christmas cookie caper, the cookie, the Christmas cookie caper that's coming up, and we need Christmas cookies, all right? So let me give you some, some information on that. Hey, Andy, can you bring the slide up? Okay. On the website, fbc.info, you're going to see a little link. You click on that link. And we need you to sign up for cookies because we need a cookie for you. Are you sure? Okay, because you're yeah, very, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Cookie for you? No? We need lots of cookies, and we need cookies on a disposable tray. They need to be homemade. Come on, ladies, just whip out your bet. Here we go. I know, right? <laughs> Holding up their hand. We need the cookies. You need to make them by December 5th and 6th, all right? So you need to bring them to the church on a disposable plate. we got a hand right here in the back. Look at this kid. He's like, oh, they're giving out cookies. Okay. <laughs> now listen, I, I know I'm making a big deal about this, but what I'm being told is we're a little bit behind on having cookies wired up to go, all right? And you guys know, this is First Bible Baptist. Food is our thing, all right? People are going to come to this thing, and they're going to expect not only uh, a great evening of music, and it's going to be great, 4,000 children all singing at the top of their lungs, but we also want them to have a time of fellowship in the back with some uh, great cookies. Does that make sense? All right, so you get it. Please go to the website. If you can do it, sign up so that Gary Sauer knows, so he can kind of plan and know what to expect in terms of cookies. And then one other announcement. Right after the second service, there are going to be baptisms. So if you would like to uh, hang around after the second service, you'll get to see a few people make a public profession of their faith in Christ, and that's always a great time. All right, stand with me and let's be dismissed. Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for Sunday. Thank you for this vision. Oh God, I pray that um, we're just, ex I think, Lord, I speak for all of us when I say we're excited about what's coming next. Father, I pray that um, you would help us and that we would serve you and it would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I got a couple cookies. Anybody wants a cookie? Feel free to, uh, they're cookies. Good for you.